hard. So I think we've waited long enough now. I'm trying to babysit my little nephew. He's not too well today, but I don't expect him to give any trouble. Today's topic is the cell. So this is basically us looking in more details on the cell, like the organelles, everything that we spoke about last week. Uh, but before we do, we, we definitely have to talk about the microscope because without the microscope, we wouldn't even be looking at cells or even talking about cells. So any microscope at all, we wouldn't be talking about cells or even tissues if it wasn't for the invention of microscope around two centuries ago. They discovered the light microscope first and the light microscope helps to look at cell structures, the cell wall, the nucleus. But for this diagram, I'll definitely ask you guys to study it. Just know the parts in detail, know how you adjust, know how you focus because next week I'll probably just give you another quiz on this like just to have a basic understanding of the microscope itself the light microscope was invented first then they invented the electron microscope light microscope basically uses light rays to reflect the structure the large structures on the cell so anything that is below 200 nanometers you can't really see that with a light microscope the important thing is that electron microscope was invented and with the electron microscope now you can actually see the smaller structures in the cells for example you can see the mitochondria you can see the, the golgi all of these things you're able to see as a result of the invention of electron microscope and you have two types of electron microscope transmission electron microscope and scanning electron microscope it's pretty complicated but it would be nice and ideal to actually be able to use an electron microscope understand the principles of electron microscopy itself even with coronavirus even though they sequenced the, the RNA of the virus and was able to say that this is a coronavirus what they actually did when corona came out to really confirm that it was a coronavirus the electron microscopy so there are different types of microscopy bright field you can stain the cell or you probably won't stain the cell so when you come in this week for example if you look through the microscope and you see a gram for example a gram positive cell or a gram negative cell you are able to tell me that you're looking through a light microscope that is basically staining the cell wall and do you remember the structure or the component of the cell wall anybody bacterial cell wall anybody remember a letter p starting with p pectin. Hmm? repeat just pectin Pep, more like peptidoglycan Remember that? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And lipopecoic acid. So for example, the gram-positive cell wall, you have the peptidoglycan layer. And in order to see a cell through a light microscope, you will have to stain this component in the cell wall. Otherwise, if you look at the cell through the light microscope, this is what it will look like. This picture on your left, this is what it will basically look like without staining. And I have a lot of stuff. For example, if I take a stool sample that has a lot of bacteria, or a stool sample from you, anything, anybody, for example, a dog stool sample, dog, dogs tend to have a lot of parasites. Yes, I'm a weird scientist. I do a lot of work on stool, strangely. But if when you look through the microscope and you see the cell, sometimes you can use iodine to stain um, components in the cell. And based on the morphology, the shape, the size, you'll be able to tell what exactly you're looking at just from a light microscope. You also have fluorescent microscope that actually use a fluorescent tag yeah. to tag like a molecule on the cell or like an antibody to tag the cell and this will have a fluorescent dye so if you look here all the way down to the left the last cell on the slide you can actually see fluorescent staining so that's basically that for microscope i would say study this diagram because i'll use this for the next tutorial session so you'll be able to tell me that you have different types of microscope light microscope electron microscope what you can see through a light microscope what you can see through an electron microscope so this is just a comparison of all so i would say know how it works you don't have to know by detail how it works but at least you know that for example you have the light source they all have a condenser and there's a little area 
area where you put the, the specimen so that the, the light typically goes through the condenser and reflect the image. Is it actually? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. That, that previous slide with the condensing lens, that shows the three different types of microscopy, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So as I said, you okay. have light, electron, and on the electron, you have two types. Transmission electron microscopy, the scanning electron microscopy. You can already see the nucleus, for example, light microscope, but what you're not able to do is create magnification or even high resolution. So with the scanning electron microscopy, when you see them looking like this, tend to be black and white, highly enhanced, three-dimensional structures, which this looks like, they basically for this cell looks on the scanning electron microscopy. And this is basically a chondrocyte. You know where a chondrocyte cell come from? It's like in cartilage. Exactly. So it's on the slides, cartilage. With the invention of transmission electron microscope, we were able to, to zoom in so much on the cell membrane, they could tell you the detailed structure of the cell membrane. So the cell membrane is a type of plasma membrane. It encloses the entire content of the cell. It surrounds the cytoplasm and or all the organelles inside the cell. The cell membrane is not always the outermost layer. In eukaryotic cells, most cells have cell membrane, but for prokaryotic cells, we know they have cell wall. Exactly. Good job, Daniel. You're working for the A+. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Basically, the cell membrane is comprised of three things, and you need to know them. Naturally, they're in everything. They're in all of us. Carbohydrates, protein, fat carbohydrates, protein, fat. And if you can look at the diagram here, this is basically a cell membrane. It's showing globular proteins. You have um, different types of proteins that are usually on the cell membrane. Some of them you call alpha helix protein, integral protein, peripheral proteins. And this is basically showing the same thing. So they're just different looking diagram, but if you pay attention to the details, it's saying the same thing. Some are just giving a lot more details than others. So for example, cell membrane usually selectively permeable or semi-permeable. It has pores, has to allow stuff in and out, like every almost all living things, I think. There has to be a way to admit things and also excrete things. I would say know the percent protein content, for example. I might just ask a random question that would say what percentage protein are typically on cell membrane. Lipid, 35% carbohydrate 5%. And as I said, light microscope will not be able to show you that there's a phospholipid or there's a peripheral protein. The light microscope is only able to tell you that there is this thick cell wall and you can put a dye that will trap the dye into the cell wall. And that's how you basically know the difference. For the transmission electron microscope, you can see the cell membrane, you can see the protein integral integrated into the cell membrane. Fat is a very integral part of it. We, we have the cholesterol here, lipid, phospholipid. So the phospholipid bilayer is a very important part of the cell membrane. Phospholipid bilayer basically contains phosphate groups on the head, like right here that I put in the cursor. And down here, you will have the fatty acid. So it's phospho, phosphate, and lipid. Phosphate and lipid. And also you'll have carbohydrates uh, anchoring to proteins. They're usually basically attached to the, to the peripheral protein. So with high magnification, when you use an electron microscope and you zoom in on the cell wall, what you see is a trilaminar appearance. And this is what you're seeing down here, right? You have two dark lines and you have a thin electrolucent zone right in the middle here. And this is the first dark line. This is the second dark line. And I just put this diagram above for comparison so that you can just use the imagination to see what exactly you're seeing. So even though you're seeing the dark line here, you know, the dark line here is most likely the protein structures that are being stained up here. And the lipid component likely to be the electrolucent zone or electron lucent zone. So again, zooming in on the cell 
membrane, you have a trilaminar appearance. Classically, you can look here and you see the protein layer on the top, protein monolayer at the bottom, as well as the phospholipid bilayer in the middle, which was what we were saying here. So the cell membrane is not just a coat, it's protein, lipid, carbohydrate. And if you look onto the cell membrane, a lot of cell membranes will have iron ch transport channel, also have antibodies anchored on the cell membrane waiting for antigen to bind to it. In the case of coronavirus, you have the cells in the respiratory tract. What the coronavirus will have to attach to a receptor in order to get inside your body. Right? So the receptor, for example, for coronavirus is called angiotensin converting enzyme. That's like a receptor that the virus has bind to specifically. And you know, there has to be a property on the virus itself that will bind to the cell. So there are two receptors or two molecules that are communicating or interacting. So you have the spike protein from the virus binding to the angiotensin converting enzyme receptor in your respiratory cells. So all cells have receptors or most of them will have receptors that will um, have antibodies as well as receptors that will alert the cell when there is, for example, an invasion or a potential invasion of something potentially fatal to the cell. So this is just a, another diagram showing the cell membrane having receptors, enzymes, channels to allow iron, potassium, sodium will go through these membranes. Yeah, that's basically that for this section. And nothing new on this slide. It's just uh, another up close look at the cell membrane showing glycoproteins, carbohydrates, glycolipids, cholesterol. So what's important here, cell membranes will have peripheral proteins, integral proteins. These are important for the to the structure of the cell. And this is basically just showing the connection as well with proteins, structural protein, membrane proteins, as well as the cytoskeletal filament. So for example, the actin, myosin, microtubules, some of these proteins are actually attached to the cells via the integral protein. So the lipid bilayer, we basically just brushed over that. I probably didn't say it in specific words, but membranes are made up of lipid bilayer. We know that there are two hydrophilic and hydrophobic leaflets. Would anybody be able to tell me the area that is supposed to be water-fearing based on just the definitions? Hydrophilic, hydrophobic. The hydrophobic section would be water-fearing. Exactly, because phobia is a fear, but I'm not sure the fatty acid tails <laughs> know that they are fearful of water. So I guess it's just a biological instinct. The cell membrane is made up mostly of protein, but the phospholipid bilayer is the most important constituent of the cell, the cell membrane. So the clinical point here, and I always throw in the clinical points so that you guys can see the relevance of you learning all of these things as engineers. When you learn these things, I'm sure you're trying to learn to create the next invention, to do the next big thing to be the next genius if you are. So with the electron microscope, we were able to identify diseases that affect the kidney, affect small sections of the kidney. For example, the glomerular basement membrane, you have a lot of diseases, a lot of inherited or um, familial diseases that can affect the kidney, affect the basement membrane of the kidney. So sometimes when you see young people having kidney disease, it's as a result of family or genetic mutation. With the electron microscope, what this was able to do help us to magnify as well as zoom in onto the glomerular basement membrane of the kidney itself. There are certain diseases that are autoimmune where you produce antibodies to your own basement membrane in the kidney. So as a result, you have antibodies attacking your own antibodies, which is why these sometimes we call them autoimmune.
your own antibodies or even antibodies from infection that you've gotten in the past, they will attach to the basement membrane of the kidney. And with the electron microscope magnifying, looking, taking, for example, a biopsy of the kidney or a biopsy of the basement membrane, looking through the microscope, you'll be able to see if, for example, a person's glomerular basement membrane is thickened. So sometimes you have glomerular basement membrane disease that causes thickening of the glomerular basement membrane. And this can be reflected as inflammation. So for example, when the antibodies bind to the glomerular basement membrane, it becomes a little bit more thickened, or you can actually see the antibodies, not by structure, but you know that the basement membrane is a bit thicker than it should be. So that's the function of the electron microscope. Even poorly differentiated cancers, and as I said, looking at the mitochondria, the electron microscope will be able to help you with that. And there are a lot of diseases of the muscles. Kids are born with certain disease of the muscles where they're weak. And this is probably as a result of alteration of the mitochondria. In terms of the discovery of Vercella zoster, smallpox, Hep B, those were attributed to the electron microscope, as well as Ebola, Narwa virus, as well as severe acute respiratory syndrome, even the same coronavirus that we spoke about. So this is just a picture showing the electron micrograph of a renal biopsy. And this obviously shows, well, not obvious to you, but it shows anti-glomerular basement membrane, glomerular nephritis, which means that there are antibodies depositing on the person's basement membrane. Sometimes what they do in, when they do like electron microscope or electron microscopy for a diagnosis, I mean, we don't do that here. Typical problem that you find here, like when you're doing laboratory stuff or even research work as a student, it's difficult to have access to things to actually help with learning so that you can at least feel a little bit more confident about what you do. As I was saying, like the glomerular basement membrane, it can become thickened, for example, if you have a lot of antibodies or if you have a lot of inflammatory cells there. So the electron microscope would be able to show you this, for example. And this is basically an immunofluorescent staining. You can also use an antibody, an anti-GBM anti antibody. So you can use a tag or an antibody that will bind to the antibody on the glomerular basement membrane, and that will give it a fluorescent staining. This is Varicella zoster virus. And as we already touched on the last session, viruses are not cells. We're just trying to make sure that we know this as a scientist. But we know that electron microscope was able to aid in the discovery of Varicella zoster virus. Varicella zoster is a virus that is a part of the big DNA family, herpes one, herpes two, Varicella, all of these things are under the same family of DNA viruses. But what's important is that you will know that a virus usually has like an outer coat, just like, like a cell that has like a plasma membrane or a cell wall. But this outer coat is obviously not a cell membrane or a cell wall. It's basically a protein shell. And the virus itself is usually comprised of mostly protein. So what you will see surrounding most viruses are envelope protein. And you'll also see the genetic material within. And as we said, remember, you don't have the organelles like the mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, all of these things are not there because it uses your cell to carry out that function in order for it to replicate. This is also an electron microscopy of Ebola. As you can see on the right, this is what it looks like. And this is just a diagram that shows the structure of it. It also has an envelope, a nuclear capsid, and this is just a magnification on the glycoprotein structure. And this is the uh, an electron microscope of SARS to the left. So sometimes it can stay in the cell, stay in the component of the cell itself. Corona itself, you see it also has its envelope and envelope protein here. And remember when I said that every cells have a receptor, your cell have a receptor that will receive the coronavirus. When corona comes into your body, this protein here, spike protein is what binds to your angiotensin converting enzymes or the ACE receptor. So this glycoprotein, spike protein is what interferes or binds to your cell and allows it to be incorporated inside of the cell. Remember, it's an obligate intracellular 
parasite. It has to be inside of your cell in order to replicate itself in order to live. So it's basically a parasite. What's also important to know is that yes, there's a cell membrane, but there are also things that are beside or between or around the cell membrane. Because remember, cells are going to be beside each other. Remember, your body is a network of cells. You have the epithelial cells, which we talk about in the last um, session, where you have the keratinocytes on the skin, the hepatocytes in the liver, the neuronal cells, for example, in the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system. You have the skeletal muscle or myocyte. You have the cardiac myocytes. These are all cells, cardiac heart cells, skeletal myocytes, skeletal cells. So when these cells are together or they're in proximity to each other, they communicate with each other. So it's like you standing beside me and I find a way to communicate with you. I can touch you. I can look at you. It can be in many different ways. So how the cells communicate is also important and they communicate via junctions. So these junctions have different functions. So you will find that you have gap junctions, tight junctions, tight junctions that hold individual cells close together. You also have desmosomes. These are also protein structures that are anchored by filaments to help. And there's also gap junction. Remember, we spoke about the cardiac myocyte with intercalated this. Remember that, Daniel? Yes. And this is how you even relate this also back to the cell membrane itself. The intercalated discs are basically gap junctions. So these are just junctions, gaps between the cell that create action potential or facilitate action potential where molecules or ions move across the cell in order to communicate with the next cell. So it's like electrical activities can jump across gap junctions in the heart and even in the central nervous system. So the function of the tight junctions, they are common between the epithelial cells. These tight junctions help with permeability. It forms a permeability barrier. Remember, cells are selectively permeable. Cell membranes sometimes are selectively permeable. The cells are going to be close together. Remember, one thing can and just jump from one cell to another cell. So the tight junctions are what will prevent random stuff from going in and out of the cell. So along with the tight junctions, you have anchoring junction, macula and zonula adherence. Also gap junction or communicating junction, as I said before, it's used for communication or spreading action potential across presynaptic nerve terminal to postsynaptic. There's just a space or a junction between it where the calcium calcium, sodium, potassium, whatever is required to simulate an action potential, they can move easily from one junction to the next and carry out electrical activity or facilitate the production of electrical conduits. One important thing about the tight junction, so you know that the cells are between them tight junctions, right? How you can relate this to uh, the body or in clinical sense? You have blood-brain barrier. You have a blood-brain barrier for a reason. Everything that goes inside your body Body should not automatically go to your brain. So you have to have a barrier that is biologically protective for you to prevent just random stuff. Because sometimes you give patients certain type of drugs, some of them cross the blood-brain barrier, some don't. The ones that cross the blood-brain blood barrier tend to be dangerous. So we try to ensure whatever you're giving, if it's crossing the blood-brain barrier, this is not a clinical contraindication. As you can see with the endothelial basement membrane, anybody know what endothelial cells are or where you find endothelial cells? Uh, no, they're all throughout the body. Like you can find them throughout the digestive tract as well. You find them a lot in, for example, blood vessels, right? So these are the thin, flat cells that you tend to find in blood vessels. So mostly your blood vessels are lined by endothelial cells, flat cells. Remember that these cells will create a tight junction because these are blood vessels that are trying to prevent communication with the brain. As you can see down here, you have the brain and the astrocyte. Astrocyte is another type of neuronal cell that you find in the brain. And as I said, you can have, for example, an astrocytoma that is a tumor that comes directly from the astrocyte itself. The astrocyte also helps to form the blood-brain barrier, which is why it's there. But the blood vessels are going to create that lining with the 
tight junctions because as you can see right here is the blood so this is the obviously the lumen of the blood vessels that you're in and this is the endothelial cells that make up the lumen of the blood vessel itself these blood vessels are tightly stacked together by tight junctions to prevent random stuff from in your blood to go to your brain in your eye you have different layers of cells in your eye so this is basically just showing the layers of the retina right here you just need to remember that you have a blood brain barrier and the tight junctions are what is important to create the blood brain barrier you have a blood ocular barrier which is the blood eye barrier and these tight junctions are what prevent random entry and exit of certain things inside of these cells so this is just showing the retinal pigmented layer the ret retinal pigmented epithelium so if you see epithelium endothelium endothelium it's usually in the lining of the blood vessel epithelium can be a skin it can be um any cells in the body and based on the shape will determine the type of epithelium so it can be stratified super pseudo stratified columnar we'll get into that in the next lecture we'll look more at the histology and the different shapes and size and configuration of the cell and what is epithelial epithelial what is endothelial retinal pigmented layer you just need to know that you have the adherence junction tight junction between them these are the plexiform layer you know plexiform layer nerve the nerve fiber layer so these are just for where the nerve goes so action potential move from one cell to the next and then this goes directly to your brain so once it hits the retinal pigment layer it goes to the brain travel via all of these nerve tissue and create an image and then you also have the blood testes barrier for this you just need to know that there's a blood testes barrier and is as a result of tight junction again so this is in your testes these are if you need to know these are just cells we call them sertoli cells and these cells are in between the sertoli cells are just some supporting cells that support the spermatozoa like the cells that produce the sperm and you have different types for example at the base these would be the most immature and here you would have like the primary spermatocyte and then, then the secondary spermatic cells as it relates to the tight junctions you just need to know that you have a blood brain barrier and yes i know i repeat a lot <laughs> guys that's just my nature hopefully it helps you to understand everything a bit easier as well so you just need to know that you have the tight junctions that form the blood brain barrier the blood ocular barrier the blood testes barrier and there are also anchoring junctions so you know you have the tight junctions the anchoring junctions and you also have the desmosomes at the bottom of the cell what? where is it you want to get it want to get it for me so there are different types of anchoring junctions two types of anchoring junctions zonular adherence macular adherence and also the desmosomes the anchoring junctions are important to hold the cell together resist mechanical stress and also prevent lateral disruption anchoring junctions are at the lateral border so then there are the actin filaments that help to anchor the 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 junction for example the zonula adherence usually encircle the apical part and there is also transmembrane protein catherine these are molecules that are on both sides and if you look on the diagram you can actually see them and there are certain mutation in these proteins are these molecules that create specific disease you guys as engineers or a biomedical engineer will will need to understand the detailed medical correlation it's the engineers who actually make the electron microscope who actually make the light microscope so the reality is medicine was not created by doctors medicine is a discipline that i believe was created by engineers that was created by researchers scientific researchers who are not necessarily physicians they research specific areas and as a result discover things that we can implement in clinical practice so the clinical point is the e catherines these proteins their transmembrane protein localizing the desmosome there if you have diminished expression of these e catherine they can contribute to different types of cancer like breast cancer endometrial cancer ovarian cancer 
answer. If the engineer or the molecular engineer would have to, for example, develop something that will block the e catherine regulation, that will prevent the, ge the genetic disruption. Because if the dysregulation of this protein is what predisposing some people, not all, because I mean, you can do a research on a lot of people with breast cancer or ovarian or endometrial cancer, just to see, to rule out this hypothesis that this protein is actually underexpressed in these patients, then that will confirm the hypothesis. And that's one. What can you do? What can you engineer to prevent this down regulation of this protein or the genes that are responsible for synthesizing this protein? So the, the intermediate filaments, anchor desmosomes, as I said here, transmembrane adhesion proteins. And this is basically the plasma membrane. So naturally, this is just the adhesion protein. Uh, I think I mentioned this before. Sometimes you have the microfilaments that are somewhat attached to the proteins that are used for adhesion. So the take home is that you have tight junctions, gap junctions, and you also have anchoring junctions. So the gap junction I touched on a little bit before. The gap junction we know is responsible for some metabolic activities, ionic um, transport, as I said, for generation of action potential, low resistance electrical communication. That's even with the cardiac myocyte. Ions have to go across the intercalated disc, uh, across the presynaptic, postsynaptic nerve terminals in order for electrical conduction to take place. And this diagram it helps to simplify a bit. It shows the gap junction between each cell, and it's showing between gap junctions ions and molecules passing through to the extracellular space. So you see at the top, you have cell membrane one, cell membrane two, and in between the cell, you have the extracellular space. They're held together by gap junction or connected by gap junctions. Okay, so there, there are six symmetric protein subunit called connexins that are transmembrane proteins. You can have mutation. The connexin that will basically produce specific types of disease. So the clinical point is that there are certain mutation in genes that encode for connexins. They are names based on the molecular size, but there are certain type of deafness, uh, inherited human deafness, that is as a result of mutation of connexin 26. There's also charcot marie 2 disease. I mean, you can learn a bit more on the disease, but if you're going to be an engineer and you're going to fix a problem, then the clinical relevance also has to be identified. So I might take it a little bit more clinical or link most of these things to clinical stuff because I guess the idea is for you guys to see areas in which you can explore, areas in which you can do research. The charcot marie 2 disease is basically also a mutation of connectin 22. When this mutation occurs, it causes demyelination of the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Another important organelle or important thing in the cell that we need to know and understand is the nucleus and nucleolus. The nucleus is the largest, most conspicuous structure. As we know, you can see it on a light microscope, you can see it on an electron microscope. So nucleus can be elongated, have columnar epithelium, and we'll discuss this in like, more details next week, as in the types of epithelium or epithelial cells. So you have elongated nucleus or nuclei in epithelial cells, lobulated nuclei. This might just be a random question if I should ask you. The polymorphonuclear neutrophils and the mega megakaryocytes have lobulated nuclei. Polymorphonuclear neutrophils, these are just white blood cells that help you to fight infection. Megakaryocytes are large cells that are produced in the bone marrow that helps you to produce platelets. So when you do a blood investigation, you you see your red blood cell, your white blood cells, your platelets. The platelets are derived from the megakaryocyte. All you need to know about this cell with lobulated nuclei or megakaryocyte and polymorphonuclear neutrophil. We also know that some can be mononucleated, some can be binucleated. For example, the hepatocytes, most references that I'll make will go directly to the, to the liver. So an example of a multinucleated or a binucleated cell, definitely 
definitely would need to know that just for like a little multiple choice. Oh, hi, Daniel. Yes, I was going to ask that um, for the binucleated um, nucleus or yeah, binucleated nucleus, do they only contain just the one copy of the genetic material or they have two copies? Usually the nucleus, nuclei, they're just genetic material. So if you have two, ideally it would still be RNA protein molecules, MR, messenger RNA molecules are ribosomal RNA structures that are in it. And cells, some cells you will see for replication or division, they create a direct copy. So you probably see two and it would be a copy of the genetic information. But if it is biologically natural that it has two, more than likely genetic information is the same because it basically carry out the same function. Okay, thank you. So the nucleolus are dense ovoid. They're usually the site of ribosomal RNA transcription and production of ribo ribosomal Zones. Also, the chromatin nuclear matrix and nuclear envelope, which is a component of the nucleus itself. So this is just a diagram showing the nuclear envelope, just like the virus of an a envelope. But as we said, virus is completely different. It's usually just an external structure. So it's an envelope, a cell wall, a cell membrane. So with this envelope, you have an outer membrane, you also a pores. And what did you say the pores were for, Daniel? Yeah, so that genetic information can be can move in and out. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this is just saying basically the same thing that I said before. This diagram is showing the same thing. Just the basic principle. There's there's an envelope. There is the nucleolus. There is the nuclear pore. There's also the matrix as well. So the clinical point to take away from nuclei. We know that the cell might have one. As you can see, the on the left, on the extreme left, you have one, two. For example, there's one in this cell, right? If, for example, the person has cancer, the nucleus might just be much bigger. It might just be much bigger because there is buildup of protein. There's disorganized cell replication. There's disorganized cell cycle. The cell can be disorganized in arrangement based on uncontrolled proliferation that you can see in cancer cells. So sometimes you might just see uh, the nuclei or, or the nucleus so big, so dense, usually not the size. It's not the normal size. It's distortion in morphology. So what you would need to know where that is concerned is that you can have more than one nuclei in a regular epithelial cell. That just means that that is a mutation if it's not supposed to be more than one and this might just indicate that there is some form of malignancy so there's a chromatin matrix that can be stained and that's a part of the nucleus as well and this contains highly folded dna proteins rna we have a slight idea as to the structure and the function of the mitochondria we know that what's important to even retain is atp krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation so the clinical point as it relates to mitochondria, there are pathways or different function of the mitochondria that can be affected that will result in certain disease. Impairment in ATP synthesis you can have optic neuropathy, ophthalmoplegia. These are those problems with the eye. You can have problems with the liver, kidney, Panconi syndrome, problems with the pancreas, problems in the bloodstream, and even with the disruption of the mitochondrial DNA can exist diseases, even skeletal muscle diseases, myopathy. Myopathies are usually just muscle diseases that can result of our disruption of the mitochondrial DNA. And for the endoplasmic reticulum, this is just a diagram that shows roughly, you know, we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the difference between the smooth and the rough endoplasmic reticulum is that the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on it and that's just basically the big difference so the ribosomal structures make it look rough which is why they call it rough 
endoplasmic reticulum. They're usually closely associated with the nuclear envelope. So, you know, you have the nuclear envelope on the outside and the nuclear pore. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is usually closely associated with the nucleus or the nuclear envelope. And so is the rough um, endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum function in carbohydrate metabolism. For example, in the hepatocytes, there's gluconeogenesis making glucose and um, they use the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase in the membrane. They convert glycogen to glucose. So how you relate this clinically is the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for even the sugar metabolism. This is important. For example, in some patients who have diabetes, they have to go through what we call glycogenolysis where they have to reverse or break down the glycogen to release the glucose because they're they're hypoglycemic or their blood glucose is very low there is also enzymes for example the cytochrome p450 this is a common enzyme in the liver good now you know that it's produced by the smooth endoplasmic reticulum this enzyme is basically responsible for degradation or degeneration of a lot of drugs so most drugs that you know you take it's metabolized by the liver and as a result of this enzyme cytochrome p450 this is also important for alcohol metabolism as well it also degrades lipid and produce steroids for example in steroid secreting cells like your ovary your testes your adrenal gland so Testes, adrenal gland, ovary, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum helps to produce steroids for those cells. There's also something similar called the sacroplasmic reticulum. This is found in your muscles. So if I should ask you a quick trick question or a not so difficult question. You should know that the sacroplasmic reticulum is equivalent to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The sacroplasmic reticulum is usually found in muscle cells and they're responsible for regulating calcium iron. You know that calcium is necessary for muscle contraction and to mediate action potential in order for you to walk. The calcium has to be released from the sacroplasmic reticulum and at least now you know that it's something that's similar to the endoplasmic reticulum that produces this calcium. So this is just a bigger diagram of everything that we've said. Um, so just for repetition, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum helps to synthesize lipids. And we know the, all the other functions that it carries out. Degrades the soluble lipid itself, it degrades the alcohol, a lot of drugs, so it produces these enzymes to help with that. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, on the other hand, it's round, it's granular and electron microscope. And the difference between this and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, as I've said before, is that they have external ribosome that gives it the rough appearance and networks of cisterna and vesicles. So it's the rough endoplasmic reticulum is usually continuous with the nuclear envelope and the ribosomes are usually just sitting outside on top of it, which gives it the rough appearance. There's also polyribosomes. These are ribosomes that are connected to messenger RNA strands. So the rough endoplasmic reticulum is also very important for the synthesis and export of protein, glycoprotein, responsible for translation, folding, transport, of protein as well. Even proteins that are important for the membrane, the cell membrane. Remember when we're looking at the cell membrane and we're looking at proteins, the structural protein, integral protein. Sometimes these proteins are made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum and are transported to the cell, to our to the cell membrane. There are different ways in which things are transported in or around or outside of the cell. So you'll know that there's endocytosis there's exocytosis and transcytosis. These are just different ways in which things are transported inside the cell 
are transported from within to the external environment. Once proteins are synthesized in the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they're transported to the Golgi complex in transfer, transfer vesicle. We'll look at inclusion, inclusion bodies, and you'll see that there are vesicles, there are glycogen that can be within the cell with just random function. They're not necessarily organelles, they're just in it. Like, for example, fat lipid droplets can just be randomly in the cell with specific function to provide energy in to the cell when necessary to as direct source of energy. So the clinical point for the rough endoplasmic reticulum, there is endoplasmic reticulum storage disease that can occur as a result of a genetic mutation, as a result of misfolded proteins. So when the proteins are synthesized, the folding process can be abnormal. You make the protein and it's misfolded and it's not the right structure. It's basically going to create aggregates of non-functional protein and this can result in storage disease. There's also dysfunction in unfolded protein response. So when the protein is folded, there's no response and the protein remains defective, like a defective protein. There's supposed to be the signal transduction pathway that's activated. That's not activated to correct the errors, then the body won't recognize the errors. And many pathologies, if you look at the molecular level, you'll realize that it's usually there is genetic miscoding or mistranslation. And as a result, the genetic information is not correct to begin with. All congenital issues are as a result of abnormal mutations or miscoded protein. So in terms of the rise- Excuse me, Dr. Lee. Yeah. I wanted to know, would you, for example, test us on the clinical points? If I make clear mention, I'll probably test you on it, but I won't just, you know, randomly put in like shortcuts, my retweet, stuff like that you don't need to understand, you know? I'll tell you when you need to know it. And if I do decide to, you know, factor that as a significant part of it, I'll definitely let you know or guide you as to what to read. All right, so the ribosomes can have free ribosomes or polyribosomes. They're in the cytoplasm. The single ribosomes are inactive and are there to synthesize proteins, synthesize amino acids. So the ribosome may be attached to the outer nuclear membrane as well. And as we know, the rough endoplasmic reticulum is closely attached to the nuclear membrane or nuclear envelope. The ribosomes can be attached to that as well because the ribosomes are also attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So as I said, the ribosome can be free where they're in the cytoplasm and they're just there to synthesize a protein for internal use of the cell. Or they can attach to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, synthesize protein for export from the cell or protein destined for lysosome. So it can make protein that you need to send outside or it can make protein that you need to use within the cell. In terms of the basic structure of the ribosome, it has two subunits, a large subunit with two RNA and 49 proteins and a small subunit which contains one RNA molecule and three small proteins and this diagram basically shows that here. So you have the small subunit right here and large subunit. In terms of the Golgi complex, there are array there are arrays of flattened, slightly curved membrane-bound sacs called cisternae, and they're associated with vesicles. So what's important is the Golgi, they're associated with the vesicles, and we'll touch a little bit more on the importance of these vesicles. So the Golgi complex, can, it has a concave side and a convex side. There are three functionally distinct parts. You have the cis network and also trans-Golgi network, as well as the, the Golgi complex. So we have the cis, the medium, compartment and trend. So the Golgi complex add protein and polysaccharides, protein to sugar for glycoprotein, um, membrane lipids, and produce lysosome. And we'll touch a bit on the function of the lysosome in subsequent um, slides. So we have the cis phase of the Golgi here, and we also have the trans phase, which is the other side. And as I said, 
they're very important function. Intracellular protein, protein for within the cell, protein for outside of the cell. Major role, however, is for packaging secretory protein by the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And we said that while we were touching on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, they're there to package proteins as well. And the materials, when they're packaged, they're, they actually pass from the cis to the distal trans side. So they move from this side, the cis side, and go over to the trans side. So they're very important for glycosylation, phosphorylation, clinical relevance of the Golgi apparatus. If I should say you no know, clinical relevance, this would be like the, the best one I would pick because this is common. But for now, you guys don't really have to stress yourself about the clinical correlation. If you're interested in research, however, I would say pay keen attention to the clinical correlations because that's where you will make a difference. That's where you'll make the relevance come in. So for example, the Golgi apparatus, you can have disorders where there is excessive protein that is built up or abnormally uh, folded protein that build up in the brain and they call them neurofibrillary tangles. And if you look closely, this should have been in this picture. But what's important to note is that in Alzheimer's disease, you're looking at the Golgi apparatus. In terms of the lysosomes, lysosomes are a collection of membrane-bound vesicles and vacuoles that form the Golgi complex. They, they derive from the Golgi complex. A lot of enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes in the lysosome. But they're not necessarily like a big structure in the cell. They're just vesicles or vacuoles. So they just they're like a little round thing with enzymes, hydrolytic enzymes in it for hydrolysis. So for example, the same polymorphonuclear neutrophil that I said about the uh, lobulated nucleus, that cell, for example, it would be responsible for phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is basically when the white blood cell, for example, the neutrophil itself, engulf or eat up a bacteria that is in your, for example, your bloodstream, they're there to actually ingest these things. So what they do when they actually ingest these things, they have lysosomes with hydrolytic enzymes that break down the structural components of the bacteria itself. They are used to engulf bacteria, viruses, other pathogens. So cells with lysosomes, they function specifically for that especially in phagocytic cells or white cells. So there are different types of lysosome. They also aid in autolysis. Autolysis means that it creates a program in the cell that allows the cell to kill itself. So that's programmed cell death. That's a disadvantage that's lacking or that's a problem in cancer cells. These cells undergo mutation of certain genes that prevents autolysis. If those cells could program their cell death or die just by programming, then we wouldn't even have a problem with cancer. But these cells lose the function to die naturally so they keep dividing, 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 taking up all the nutrients, doing uncontrollable things, not folding the proteins properly, and as a result, uncontrolled proliferation. So primary lysosomes are usually the newly formed ones. They don't really have digested material. Secondary ones are usually larger. And obviously the tertiary ones might tend to have like the digested material because as we said, they have a lot of enzymes for hydrolysis or hydrolytic enzymes. So if you look on the diagram on the right, it's just showing the anatomy of lysosomes. Um, and important to note, the hydrolytic enzyme. So you just need to know that you have primary lysosome, secondary lysosome, tertiary lysosome, and have an appreciation that they have hydrolytic enzyme that can aid in phagocytosis or destruction of bacterial cell wall or viral structure. In terms of the clinical correlation of lysosomes, there is a disease called Tay-Sachs disease. This is a mutation in the XA or the sugar component of it that basically results in accumulation of gangliosides. So this GM2 gangliosides, 
because there's a mutation and there's a deficiency, of course, there's an accumulation of this ganglioside. You can't create no hydrolysis, can't break down anything. So th this is a buildup. And as a result, these ganglioside damage the nerve, causing demyelination of the nerve. And if we say demyelination, we will touch a bit on nerve cells. And you will know that nerve cells are wrapped around what we call myelin sheet. And you probably do know that already anyway. The myelin sheet is basically what helps the nerve to propagate action potential rapidly. So if you have demyelination of the nerves, then the nerves not going to function. The action potential is not going to be carried out properly. Person is more likely going to have paralysis so that has to do with neurological deficit. Perioxisomes are similar to lysosome in the sense that they're just random vesicle structure or vesicular oval structures. They're found in most cells. They're prominent in the hepatocytes and as well as the, the hepatocytes are the liver cells. Remember that. And they're also pre present in the proximal tubule or the kidney. So they're engaged in oxidative reaction. So the function of the peroxisome, cell respiration, fatty acid metabolism, alcohol degrading, transamination as well as it's necessary for myelination of the nerve so inclusions promise i'm almost done inclusions include glycogen for example they're not like organelles but they're just there for example lipid droplets they're just there to provide energy in the event that it's needed. So glycogen is a D-glucose polymer. It's mostly stored in the cytoplasm of hepatocytes or the liver cells and skeletal muscle. You can stay in the cell and you can see the glycogen with, for example, periodic acid shift. That's a stain. If you look at the diagram here, and also if you do electron staining, you can see the granules by electron microscope. So the glycogen are, they're usually close to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum where there's rapid conversion to glucose. As I said, they're just there for rapid conversion of glucose. For example, if you become hypoglycemic, the liver cells will basically cause what will cause glycogenolysis or lysis of the glycogen storage in the hepatocyte that will release the glucose for you to use in the event that you're hypoglycemic. So there are glycogen storage disease as a result of deficiency of certain enzymes. You don't need to know this. You just need to know that there are glycogen storage disease. You don't need to know the, the details of it. Yeah. So another inclusion include the lipid droplets. They're stored in the cytoplasm of many cells. So you have lipid droplets randomly in cells as well. And uh, they're used for energy and cell metabolism. We already know that the adipocytes are the fatty they store lipid, they're used for thermal insulation, physical padding, and also for shock absorption. So they form stacks. No, you can't touch it. Yeah, so they basically contain triglyceride, esters, and also cholesterol. And just like the glycogen, the lipid droplets are closely associated with the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Steatosis, we're talking about lipid, and we all should know about at least fatty liver. You know, people always talk about alcohol, and when people drink alcohol, um, a lot of alcohol, they get a fatty liver. It is actually true that the, the fat droplets accumulate in their hepatocytes. So if you look at this diagram, <laughs> if you look at this diagram, you can see a normal liver here and also you see a fatty liver here. These are just fatty droplets. This can occur in a lot of diseases like, for example, diabetes, alcohol liver disease, hepatocellular carcinoma, and this is carcinoma of the liver. Carcinoma of the liver can be caused by hepatitis, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, those viruses. So um, in terms of the cytoplasmic vesicles, endocytosis, you guys definitely need to know, endocytosis, exocytosis, transcytosis. So endocytosis is basically formed by invagination of the plasma membrane. So the 
plasma, what's the difference between a cell membrane and the plasma membrane? Anybody know? Sorry, my internet cut out just a while ago. <laughs> so, what will save you? For endocytosis, the, the vesicles enter the plasma membrane by pinching off from the surface. So it just pinch off from the surface and creates a vesicle. When it does that, it takes up, can take up fluid, macromolecules, and solids. If you look at this diagram here, you can do like a general comparison between different types. We touched on phagocytosis a bit. Phenocytosis is basically as it relates to water. So it's like the vesicle buds off, for example, with a little water molecule. Endocytosis can also be receptor mediated. So the important thing to note is that endocytosis can be receptor mediated and also be as a result of phenocytosis where it just pinches off with water molecule or it's created as a result of receptor. And if there's mutation of the receptor, then you might have a problem as well. So the cytoplasmic vesicles, there is the fluid phase of endocytosis. As I said, phenocytosis means drinking, well, the cell is just basically pinching off with water molecules. Receptor mediated endocytosis, highly selective uptake. So this is basically when it's specific for macromolecules. So the difference is you have a fluid phase endocytosis or phenocytosis where it pinches off with water molecules, or you have receptor mediated where there's a receptor involved and it pinches off taking with it macromolecules, hormones, growth factors. Cholesterol is synthesized by the liver and it's transported to the bloodstream. And in the bloodstream, it's LDL, right? This is as a result of receptor mediated endocytosis. So when cholesterol is synthesized in the liver and it has to go to the bloodstream, it's as a result of receptor mediated endocytosis. So your relevance would be find out how you can prevent elevated LDL because the low density lipoprotein is the bad cholesterol. But you can figure out as the engineer, the uh, engineer knowing the cellular level and the detail, how can you prevent the excessive um, receptor mediated endocytosis in patients with hyperlipidemia. Clinical point, familial hypercholesterolemia is as a result of mutation in a gene on chromosome 19 that codes for LDL. So as I said many times before, the root of the problem will always go back to the gene germline. If you have a tendency or a predilection to be or to do or to what, it's mostly likely due to genetic factors influenced by possibly the environment because we're all cells interacting with the environment. In this familial hypercholesterolemia, there is deep effect in receptor and the, the, the receptor loses affinity for a coated pit so the uptake of cholesterol is blocked. The problem is this cholesterol is inactive. It's yeah. blocking the uptake of cholesterol. So as a result, you have an elevated level of cholesterol in the blood. And then there's also transcytosis. It's selective endocytosis it's mediated by a flask-like invagination in the plasma membrane, termed caviole. These are specifically coated by proteins called caviolin. That's the difference between transcytosis. Once you can remember this thing in red, you should be fine. So many caviole in the epithelial cell mediate transcytosis, whereby vesicles derived from caviole are taken across the cell membrane and released into another. Um, so most of these vesicles actually derive from the Golgi complex. And in this part where the vesicle move to the cell surface, fuse with the plasma membrane and discharge the content in its exterior. So it's just basically picking up stuff with a vesicle and pushing it outside of the cell as the diagram here is suggesting. There's also microtubules. This component of the cell you guys will need to know as well. 
the important thing to know, yes, they're cylindrical, that we know, that not important, but they are a constituent of cilia, flagella, and central. So just remember that part. So cytoplasmic filaments can be intermediate filaments, actin filaments, microtubules. And this is basically just showing intermediate filaments, this image showing intermediate filaments in the keratin or keratinocyte. So there are specific problems with intermediate filaments that can also create diseases so the intermediate filaments there are different types they have nuclear filaments which are usually in the inner nuclear envelope there are the desmosomes as we already touched basically that are also form a part of the junction of the cells and for mechanical forces between cells to, or to prevent disruption lateral disruption there's a hemidesmosome mechanical force to which basically form the extracellular matrix. Uh, you guys should know just these basic structures that are intermediate filaments at the junctions, the cell intercellular junctions. We know we have hemidesmosomes, dem desmosomes. <laughs> so these help to form tight junctions or gap junctions. And also with the epidermis, there's keratin. This is also a form of intermediate filament. Desmin. Desmin is also a form of intermediate filament that helps with the integrity of muscles. Dementin. You find them in mesenchymal cell or neurofilament in nerve cells. So just know where you find them, these intermediate filaments. Clinical points will relate to obviously the origin of the filament or where you find the filament. For example, if you find it in muscles, nerve tissues, for the centrosome, central, there, uh, centrosome is a major microtubule organizing center. It's the site of generation of new cytoplasmic microtubule and mitotic spindle. Most of this you will know, for example, in cell replication. Okay, and this is just a picture of replication and different cycle or phase uh, that the cell goes through during replication, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. If you look even throughout the replication cycle, you see the formation of centromeres and also mitotic spindles. So these cytoskeletal structures or components assist in even replication or even migration and movement of structures within the cell during replication and that's the end for for the the lab session this week i'll just read out the exact procedure of a gram stain i'll just tell you exactly the detail of how to do a gram stain so with the gram stain we know that you stain the cell with crystal violet for one minute so the important thing is the one minute you normally have a bacteria on a blood agar plate i can show you what that looks like in practice because you won't even really see it unless you come into the lab so i can show you what the bacterial colonies will look like on for example a blood agar plate and what you will do is take the bacterial colony you put it on the gram stain right the first thing you do is to stain it with crystal violet so the crystal violet is what you will put on it for one minute and then you rinse it off with water right so the second step is you drain off the water and then you put iodine solution and let it stand for another minute right so the first thing is crystal violet the second thing is iodine solution your homework would be why crystal violet what what's the constituent of it right iodine why iodine what's the component or constituent of it so after the iodine for one minute you rinse it off with water then you add a decolorizer or acetone you can tell me a little bit about the acetone if you want also or an alcohol mixture to decolorize the cell because remember you put crystal violet on it so that's the point of decolorizing it and then you rinse it off then you put a counter stain on it saffroning for 30 seconds this is the exact procedure right the saffroning goes on for 30 seconds briefly rinse with water again and then you drain the excess water and dry by either blotting or you can put it on a heat block so that's the entire procedure of the gram stain 
itself, although you guys are biochemical, um, biomedical engineers, you should be able to know the chemical um, structure, chemical composition, and all of these things, because ideally it's the engineers that will make everything. All right, see you guys on Tuesday if you don't have any more questions. That's it from me. Thank right. you, Doctor. No problem. Bye. All right, take care.